the DuPont Cavalcade of America. Starring Agnes Moorhead in Party Line. On the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Here is a cool and refreshing suggestion for your home this summer. Paint those drab faded walls with DuPont Speed Easy wall finish. Although you thin Speed Easy with water, it dries on your walls to a velvety oil type finish. It's easy to apply with a large brush or roller, and it dries in less than one hour. You can use Speed Easy on wallpaper, wood, plaster, or most any interior wall surface. It comes in 11 clear, beautiful colors. Speed Easy, its name, tells the story. It goes on easily and it dries quickly. It's Speed Easy, and it's made by DuPont. Agnes Moorhead, winner of the Foreign Correspondence Award, may soon be seen as one of the stars in the Metro Golden Mayor picture, Our Vines Have Tender Grapes. The DuPont Cavalcade presents Party Line, adapted from the book of the same title by Louise Baker, starring Agnes Moorhead as Miss Elmira, Mayfield's best-known, most quoted, and consulted citizen, the telephone operator. Hello. Is everybody on the line? Well, that's good. Well, friends, you will be delighted to hear that Mrs. Ned Branner gave birth to an eight-pound baby girl this morning at 520. Mm-hmm. Now, isn't that lovely? They named her Beverly. That's how I remember Miss Elmira, operator of Mayfield's Telephone Exchange. My name's Louise Maxwell, and when I was a child, there was no such thing as a dial telephone. Every family in Mayfield, rich enough to have a phone, shared it with at least three other families on what was known as a party line. We Maxwells were on a party line along with the Dexters and the Myers and the Granders. Mayfield's Telephone Exchange wasn't very large, but Miss Elmira ruled it like a queen rules an empire. I found that out when Kenneth Myers and I tried the season's most popular telephone sport once too often. You want to do this one, Louise? Hello. No, you do this one. I'll do Mr. Bennett. Hello. Miss Elmira? Well, of course it's Miss Elmira. Who's this? It's me, Miss Elmira. Kenneth Myers. Oh, I thought I recognized your voice. What do you want, Kenneth? Can you connect me with Mrs. Hogg, please, Miss, please, Miss Elmira? All right. Hello. Is this Mrs. Hogg? Yes. How are all the little pigs, Mrs. Hogg? <laughs> now it's my turn. Remember what you have to say. Sure. Let's see now. Um, um, you got Prince Albert in the tin can? Well, you better let him out. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let you do it now. Hello. Miss Elmira, will you give me Bennett's pharmacy, please? <laughs> now listen to me, young lady. If you're going to inquire for Mr. Bennett about Prince Albert, I assure you he's still in the tin can. Yes, ma'am. Moreover, Mr. Bennett has been hearing that Prince Albert joke for three generations, and so have I, and neither of us thinks it's funny anymore. No, ma'am. And now, as long as you're on the phone, you may as well take a message for your mother. I know she ain't home, otherwise you wouldn't be pulling these shenanigans. Yes, ma'am. Well, when she comes home, Louise, tell your mother I tried that pot roast recipe she gave me with a tomato, and it came out fine. That's all, I think. Oh, Oh, except the next time you're down this way, I want you to come in and see me. I want to talk to you. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Well, of course it's Miss Elmira. Who else would it be? Uh, the greengrocers? Oh, just a minute. Just a minute. Yes. Oh, well, I just saw your husband go into Jake's barber shop, Miss Cartwright. But honestly, I don't think he needed a haircut. Oh, sure, sure. I'll call you when I see him coming back into his office. Hello, Miss Elmira. Oh, oh, why, hello there, Louise. Come to pay a call? Yes, ma'am. Well, that's real nice of you, honey. How's your ma? She's fine, Miss Elmira. Her strawberry rash is all gone. Well, now I'm real glad to hear that. Oh, just a minute, dear. Yes? Hello, Miss Dexter. You sound worried. Uh, Dr. Sims, which part... Well, which one of the boys is sick? Oh, oh, Mary Lovell, your boarder. Oh, well, these spinsters are always ailing, aren't they? 
Well, now, listen. The doctor's out at the Granger farm right now, so I'll catch him there and send him on. Oh, now, don't you worry a bit. He'll be there all right. Miss Elmira. What is it, honey? How long have you been our telephone operator? Oh, long before you were born, child. When I grow up, can I get to be one? Well, if you do what your mother tells you and don't eat too many pickles. Oh, I don't, Miss Elmira. <laughs> you stand a good chance. Now, you just play with your jacks a while, honey. Miss Elmira has to make an important announcement about a, a, a little stranger that came into the world. Who are you going to tell? Oh, everybody. Miss Elmira. What is it, child? Did you call and tell everybody when I was born? <clears throat> Naturally. How do you think they would have known about it otherwise? Well, if you tell all the news, what's the newspaper for? The men. They print it for the men. All but the personal column. The women read that. But they don't have time to read anything else. Why? Well, they're too busy listening. Easier than reading, too. All they have to do is pick up the receiver and eavesdrop. Oh. Now, run along. Run along so I can make this announcement. Well, all right. But I thought you had something important to tell me. I had. You know, um, you said for me to drop in the next <gasps> time and... Yes. Um... Oh, Yes, indeed I did. Young lady, the telephone is a scientific instrument into which the best brains of the country have been poured, and it's too valuable for little girls to use in plain jokes. It is? Yes, it is. How do you think your mother would get the news if it wasn't for the telephone? Then she'd have to read the courier, wouldn't she? You're evading the issue. The telephone is for business, so your mother can call Dr. Sims when somebody's sick, for Mrs. Cartwright to call the greengrocers and complain that the lettuce was wilted uh, for, well, the long distance. What's long distance? Well, it's long distance. It's far away. Long distance is a telephone call from out of town. Did you ever have a long distance call? Did I? Clear from Washington once. Gee. From a senator of the United States. A real one? Uh -huh. And did he talk to you on it? Well, the call wasn't actually for me. It was for the judge, but it had to go right through this switchboard. Matter of fact, if you want to be real particular, it was the senator's secretary that did the calling, but there's no use quibbling about trifles. Now, run along so I can make this announcement before the baby gets too old. got a long distance call in our life. Hello. Uh, Anna, this is Geraldine Dexter. Did you hear the news? Mary Lovell has a bow. No, more scandalous than that. Mr. Cordair has left Mrs. Cordair. No. Yes. Why, how perfectly awful. Why? Nobody knows, but they say he left a note on the pin cushion. That's right on the pin cushion, Geraldine. I just got on there. <laughs> a note, Edith. What did it say, Geraldine? Well, now, that's just what I've been trying to find out. The only person who knows besides Mrs. Cordaire is Elmira, and she won't say a word. I hear you, Geraldine Dexter. And I'll repeat what I said before, the ethics of my profession... We know, Elmira, are... we know, are as noble as those of a surgeon, and wild horses couldn't drag from you the contents of a conversation that passed over your wire. Indeed not. If Mr. Cordaire wants to leave his wife for another woman, I say it's nobody's business but his own. <laughs> and now you'll all have to hang up and need the line for other calls. <laughs> Louise, you stay here a minute, honey. I'm going next door. I'll be right back. I bet that's Mrs. Dexter right now. She got here fast. I'll open. Hello, Louise. Where's your mother? Here I am, Geraldine. Oh, I just have to talk to you, Anna. Did you hear that Miss Elmira said before she hung up? I certainly did. And I've always thought the Cordaires were so devoted. It gives you pause, doesn't it? But what do you mean? Anna. How do we know our own husbands aren't being subject to influences we know nothing about? Geraldine Dexter. Well, Clyde goes to market in San Francisco four times a year, and he's even been to Chicago three times, and everybody knows Chicago's a very bad place. Oh, well, that's just silly. Elmira would know if anything like that were going on, and she never tolerated. Hmm. Even Elmira doesn't know what goes on in San Francisco or Chicago, Anna. What about your own husband? My... Own husband? You mean Ed? Yes, Ed. He goes all over the county. How do you know some woman isn't trying to get him? Some rich widow or some country school mom? I'm going to call Elmira. You're, you're not going to let the whole town know our husbands are leaving us. I don't care. 
I'm going to put a stop to it before it's too late and my two innocent little girls are left fatherless. Yes? Miss Elmira, this is Anna Maxwell and I've got something terribly important to ask you. The answer is an up and down no. I beg your pardon? What's she saying, Anna? Shh. What did you say, Miss Elmira? Twenty-three women have called and asked the same question. And I'll tell you the same thing I've told them. Don't put a healthy body in a sick bed. You understand what I mean by that, Mrs. Maxwell? Well, I... Uh... I'm not sure, Miss Elmira. Well, you just think it over, and you will. And now, before I leave you, I want you to hear this article I cut out from the San Francisco Chronicle. Are you sitting down? That's all right. I'm not tired. Well, listen close now. <clears throat> a good wife is to a man wisdom and courage and strength and endurance. A bad one is confusion, weakness, discomfiture, and despair. Keep up your spirits, though the day be a dark one. If the sun goes down, look up to the stars. If the earth is dark, keep your eye on heaven. <clears throat> Give my regards to Mr. Maxwell. I will, Miss El... Oh, what did she say, Anna? Well, she inferred we're a couple of gossip-swallowing fools. Oh, and she's right, Geraldine. All through this thing, I've had something dreadful in the back of my mind. Something dreadful? Why, Anna... Well, I've been wishing I... Well, I've been wishing I was a spinster like Mary Lovell. Well, I'll admit I was too. But that's all gone now. I realize how lucky I am. It's more than luck. It's a blessing to have a husband like mine. I... I wish Mary Lovell had one too, even half as good. Anna, I think you've got the beginning of an idea there. What? I think we should make it our business, and seriously this time, to find a good husband for Mary. A really good husband. Poor thing. Well, it sounds like a good idea, Miss Dexter, but Mary Lovell is forever saying she's very happy as she is. I don't care what. Says Elmira, she just can't be happy unmarried. Of course not, no. Of course. Well, you better be careful, Mrs. Dexter. Mary Lovell might hear you. Oh, no. She's upstairs reading her poetry. Oh. Poor thing. If there were only some man we could introduce her to. Mm. She's already met the three Mayfield bachelors 11 times. There's no use torturing them anymore. Maybe we could give a party. The men could bring their unmarried business associates. No, well, wouldn't do her any more good than giving a dead dog a bone. Then you add a pinch of salt and sprinkling of pepper and bake in a hot oven for one hour. What's the matter with her? That means very lovers coming downstairs. Oh. Well, we'll think of something. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Never say die. By the way, how old is Mary Lovell? She's as old as I am, even if I do have two children and the beginning of a double chin. Well, I still say never say die. Oh, excuse me, girls. Excuse me, a stranger's coming in. I've got to get off the line. Uh, pardon me. Mm -hmm. I was told you might be able to help me find a room to rent. Uh, oh, excuse me. My name is Benson. Charles Oglethorpe Benson. <clears throat> My card, madam. Oh, yes, yes. New field salesman for Libby McNeil and Libby. Oh, real engraving on the card. You must make very good money. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> just what sort of room do you desire, Mr. Benson? Uh, I mean, I should be glad to help you find a room if you'll tell me your specifications. For instance, are you uh, a uh, <clears throat> married man, uh, Mr. Benson? Well, unfortunately, no. <laughs> it's not yet been my lot to find the lady of my dreams. <clears throat> I'm looking for bachelor quarters. Bachelor quarters? Ba uh, bachelor quarters. Bachelor quarters. Well, uh, you come back here in 15 minutes, Mr. Benson, and I'll have a fine room for you. You, you, you did say bachelor quarters, Mr. Benson. Well, yes, yes, I did. Of course, if it's too hard. Oh, no, no, no. No, be sure and come back now. You hear? 15 minutes. Before we bring you the second act of tonight's DuPont Cavalcade, starring Agnes Moorhead and Party Line, here's another story about a different kind of telephoning. You know, the units of an army today are linked together with telephone lines. The first wire to go in while troops are still advancing is an assault wire. Later, it's replaced by heavier wire that carries voices farther. 18 miles against assault wires, 10. You've seen pictures of it, knotted around fence posts and trees, stretched over the broken brick and stone of shattered buildings. And here's Gain Whitman to tell you more about it. Much of the telephone wire used by American forces is coated with DuPont polythene, a new plastic with outstanding insulating properties 
that help American wire to carry voices over unusually long distances. Further experiments are being made with a very thin coating of another DuPont plastic, nylon, as a protective jacket around the polythene. All of which means that these new plastics, alone or in combination, are sure to find places in many fields after the war, in the electrical industry, for refrigerator parts, for gaskets and tubing. And that's only a beginning. Polythene, discovered in England by Imperial Chemical Industries Limited and further developed here, illustrates the teamwork of science and the teamwork of a company like DuPont. So does nylon. For the manufacture of these two valuable plastics depends upon the chemists in the laboratories, the engineers who design and build plants to make them, the men and women working in the plants, and the technical servicemen who make them known to other manufacturers. All of these people work together to bring you the products of industrial chemistry we at DuPont speak of as better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Now back to DuPont Cavalcade's presentation of Party Line, starring Agnes Moorhead as Miss Elmira, ruler of Mayfield's Telephone Exchange at the turn of the century. Louise Maxwell continues the story. During all the years of my girlhood, Miss Elmira was, was one of Mayfield's most important people. She was ever willing to help, to listen, and to scold, whichever was needed. Nor did we expect any less from Miss Elmira than she gave during the time my mother and Mrs. Dexter were on their manhunt to find a suitable bachelor for spinster Mary Lovell. It was Elmira who discovered Charles Oglethorpe Benson, learned he was looking for a room, and promptly phoned our house. I don't understand you, Miss Elmira. You're shouting so I can't make out what you're talking about. I'm not shouting, Anna Maxwell. I'm just trying to tell you, you just have to take him. You just have to take him. Take whom, for heaven's sake? Your rumor. But I have no room. Didn't you hear what I've just been telling you, for goodness sake? Mr. Benson, he has no wife. Who has no wife, Elmira? I just got on. A uh, Mr. Benson, Mrs. Dexter, a new traveling man. He just got into town. That's why Mrs. Maxwell just has to rent him a room. But why should I? I have a husband. Anna, you don't understand what Elmira is saying. Mary Lovell. Oh, goodness, it's as plain as the nose on your face. Mary rooms with Geraldine Dexter. Geraldine Dexter lives right next door to you, so Mr. Benson has to room with you. That's right, Anna. But I have no room. Louise can move upstairs into Bernice's room. I'll come over and help move her things. And I'll get Clyde to bring over that good quarter-size iron bed to Rodney's room. You can have the bureau that goes with us, too. But, uh, but I... You have no right to butt any butts at a time like this, Anna Maxwell. This is Mary Lovell's one big chance to land herself a husband, and this man is perfect husband material. I could tell the minute I looked at him. How could you tell? He wears horn-rimmed spectacles. The minute Mr. Benson moved into my old room, the campaign started. The strategy was developed over the telephone. It was Miss Elmira who decided on the first great move. What Mary needs is a past. A what? What does she need a past for? Well, my goodness, do you want him to know no man's even looked at her for 15 years? Well, what kind of a past could she have? It has to be romantic. I know what. We'll make up a doctor. Mary was engaged to an upstanding young physician who got the call and, and went to China and died. Died of malaria. Uh, what about an actor? Actor are more romantic than doctors. Uh, this one could have died in a duel. Uh, for her honor. Well, that's all right. That's all right, but, but we better make it more distinguished. Mr. Benson, the distinguished type, you know. Let's see. Um... Uh, Mary was engaged to the wealthy sign of a Boston family. A beautiful youth with the soul of a poet. Oh, that's lovely. What happened to him? A floating ulcer. <laughs> and Mary has remained faithful to his memory. That's how she never married. Mm. Although many young men flung themselves at her feet. Who's to tell him all this? You are. Me? Oh, I hardly know the man. Well, he rooms at your house, don't he? What more natural than you just glide into the conversation over a cup of coffee? Oh, oh, and you better add that the tragedy has left her haggard and aged, though she's still young in years. What's that for? You want to prepare him for the way she looks, don't you? I can 
still taste that roast chicken my mother prepared for Mr. Benson's first Sunday dinner. It was a strange and wonderful day. For once, I was allowed to eat an entire meal without a single vegetable. And Mother didn't even scold when I put a gravy spot on Aunt Delia's embroidered tablecloth. We were all too busy watching Mr. Benson and Mary Lovell. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, you know, that was the best dinner I've ever eaten in my life. Ever. Why, thank you, Mr. Benson. <laughs> but you wouldn't say that if you ever tasted the roast chicken Mary made. Isn't that true, Mary? Oh, she's just flattering, Mr. Benson. I'm not good at anything. Anything? <laughs> Why, Mary Lovell, you know very well you make the best Banbury cakes in Mayfield. Oh, no. Don't believe her, Mr. Benson. Our Mary's inclined to be too modest. <laughs> Maybe that's why she's the most popular member of our unmarried set. Mrs. Maxwell. I can readily see why. Oh, Mr. Benson. <laughs> well, I guess I'll leave you two young folks to get acquainted while I see how my little girls are faring in the kitchen. They're just too quiet to see me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you... Oh, oh, I beg your me. pardon. <laughs> what were you going to say, Mr. Benson? Oh, no, no. You, you go ahead, Miss Lovell. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, do you... Do you favor reading, Mr. Benson? Well, I've never been one much with books, Miss Lovell. <clears throat> I regret that now. It's never too late to learn, Mr. Benson. <laughs> Not if a person has a good teacher, Miss Lovell. <laughs> Uh, Miss Lovell. Uh, yes, Mr. Benson. Uh, would you... Uh, would you, uh... Yes. <clears throat> lend me one of your books. Uh, why, Mr. Benson, I should love to. The 7 o'clock show. Then they went into Bennett's pharmacy. That was at 9 o'clock. They each got a cup of hot chocolate. And that's when he told her the blue of her dress matched the blue of her eyes. Well, for my money, they're as good as engaged. I wonder if my good black dress would do for the wedding. I've had it two years. Well, I'd like to ask Dad for a new print, but I know he'd raise the roof. What about you, Miss Elmira? I'm waiting for the invitation. <laughs> Elmira was right. Suddenly, a mysterious blight seemed to hit the blossoming romance. The women didn't know what to make of it. I simply can't understand it. He hasn't been over in a week, and Mary is simply hollow-eyed. He's acting pretty peculiar, too. Doesn't talk hardly to anybody anymore. Never so much as mentions Mary. Although he used to love to get me on the subject of that poor dead Boston fellow. Hasn't she confided in anyone at all? Mm, she's not the confiding sort, Miss Elmira. Oh. She's lived here with us now for 11 years, and I swear she's never told me one intimate thing about herself. Although, frankly, I don't think there's ever been anything to tell more intimate than the color of her petticoats. Till now. What color are her petticoats? Well, they're pink mostly. A few white ones, but not much lace until about three weeks ago. She got one of those 398 ones with eyelet embroidery. Hmm. That's when I knew things were getting serious. Oh, oh wait, wait. What's the matter? It's Mary. She's headed this way, and there's a look on her face. I'll call you back. Why I came to you, Miss Elmira, because I know that if anyone would know who started that awful rumor, it'd be you. Oh, <clears throat> you, uh, you say someone told him you once had a sweetheart? Yes. Well, I thought, uh, I mean, I should think that that would make you more uh, interesting, so to speak. Well, that's what he said. He said at first he was actually attracted because of my romantic past. Uh-huh. And then later it began to worry him. Oh, dear. Oh, man. Oh, who could have started that horrible rumor? I bet it was that Mrs. Cartwright. It sounds just like her. Well, it does sound like her. <clears throat> Anyway, why don't you go home and let me see what I can find out? Oh, will you, Miss Elmira? Yes, I will. Oh, thank you ever so much. I don't know what Mayfield would ever do without you. Sometimes I wonder about that myself. So 
So you'll just have to tell him, Mrs. Maxwell. You mean I'm to tell him I lied? Now, Elmira Jordan, that's not fair. After all, you made up that Boston fellow yourself. Oh, it's a shame to do away with him this way. He was such a nice boy. And so highborn. Boston best. Well, I guess I'll have to think of something to say to Mr. Benson. He'll probably never speak to me again as long as I live. Anyway, he did admit the story attracted him to Mary in the first place. So even if it's lost me a friend, it's gotten Mary a husband. And that's what we were after, weren't we? Well, there's the story of Mary Lovell, Kenneth Myers, Mrs. Dexter, Charles Oglethorpe Benson, and Miss Elmira. Mary Lovell's Mrs. Benson now, and Kenneth Myers is a major in the Army. And Miss Elmira... Well, Miss Elmira is no longer at the telephone exchange. But I can never dial a Mayfield number without hearing Miss Elmira's voice. Good morning, friends. You will be delighted to hear that Mrs. Ned Branner gave birth to an eight-pound baby girl this morning at 5.20. Mm-hmm. Now, isn't that just lovely? They've named her Beverly. Mr. Branner wanted her to call Genevieve after his mother, but Mrs. Branner's always liked the name Beverly ever since she read the Graustark book. Mrs. Branner didn't have a hard time of it at all. Her mother came down from Oakland to help out for a while. Mm-hmm. Well, goodbye now. Our thanks to you, Agnes Moorhead, and to all members of tonight's DuPont Cavalcade cast. <laughs> Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade is going to bring you a radio play about two American medical officers who sought out one of the most terrible scourges of history, typhus, the feverish, hollow-eyed emperor of death, who down through the centuries had never met his master. But armed with nothing more than a dusting gun and some white powder, the American Army Medical Corps defeated him in the hectic days of 1944. Richard Warp will be on hand next week as our star in DDT. The music for tonight's Stephon Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Our Cavalcade play was written by Sylvia Berger and based upon Louise Baker's Party Line, which is to be filmed by 20th Century Fox. This is Frank Graham inviting you to listen next week to Richard Warp. In DDT, on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is the National Broadcasting Company.